Welcome to the Backstage Creative. My name is Krista Copper. On this podcast, I interview people who work behind the scenes of theater, people who design costumes and build the costumes and build the sets and paint the sets and run the soundboard in the back and stage manage and music direct and play instruments and choreograph all of the people who who go largely unnoticed um, in live productions. I'm a musician and I've been involved with theater for many years now. And I have learned so much from sitting down and talking to people who um, do these backstage behind the scenes jobs. There's so much creativity and there's so much passion and um, there's so much dedication and sacrifice and commitment that goes on uh, to make live theater happen. And I wanted to capture some of that and I wanted to share some of those conversations that I was having with people. So almost a year now, uh, I started this podcast called The Backstage Creative and it's been a really good thing in my life. And so I hope that whether this is your first episode or whether you've been with um, me since the beginning and I've heard all of my all of the interviews, I hope that uh, this um, podcast can be a, um, a beneficial resource in your life. It can be a way for you to grow and stay encouraged and inspired when life <laughs> as an artist and as someone working in the arts, it, can get, it gets difficult. Yeah, we have to find ways to grow and stay inspired. So uh, that's one of my one of the biggest goals that I have for this podcast. There's a quote that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and it's a man named Elliot Kipchoge who, who a few weeks ago ran a marathon in under two hours, and it's the fastest time ever recorded. It is incredible. It's such an inspiring feat, and Elliot Kipchoge, the the man who who ran that race uh, is a very humble man. And so I I follow him on Instagram and he always has really good inspirational quotes. And he's, um, he's very much a team player in this whole project of trying to, trying to get a person to run a marathon in under two hours was a result of this huge team of, of, um, people. Elliot talks a lot about the importance of team and he talks a lot about uh, the support that he's received, um, through pursuing this really lofty goal. One of the quotes that he says that I just love and uh, that's been on my mind a lot is he says that 100% of myself is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team and vice versa. 1% of the team is nothing compared to 100% of myself. That And that is the meaning of teamwork. That applies so beautifully to the theater world too, right? Like 100% of myself as a bass player is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team and 1% of all of the, of the team of all of the people working behind the scenes is nothing compared to 1% of, of myself as a bass player and musician. Uh, and that's the meaning of teamwork. That's how theater works. That's how this works is that we're all bringing 100% of ourselves to the team. Today is my conversation with Laura Valenti. Laura has recently moved to New York city. She's a, a young scenic designer and scenic artist who's, who's just, you know, starting on this professional path and a delight to sit down and talk with her about uh, the transition into New York City and and some of the projects that she's working on. We get to dive into some of my favorite topics like does competition have a place in the arts and how do you grow as an artist and some other really good topics that I love to hear people's perspective about. If you like this podcast, I would love so much to hear from you. Uh, I love hearing from people. A a lot of podcasting is you're doing it yourself, right? Like you're sitting and editing for a few hours or like right now I'm sitting in my apartment talking at my computer. And so it's nice to know that there's people out there. (laughs) So I would love to hear from you. Reach out to me. You can find me on Instagram or on Facebook, or you can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. That would be so great. I I love to hear from people. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the show. If if there's been an episode that you've really enjoyed or things you would like to hear more of, I would love to hear uh, your opinions. So here we go. I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Laura Valenti. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I appreciate it. <laughs> of course. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, let's start with your background, where you grew up, um, how you got into theater and uh, like where you went to college and how you got into theater and all of that uh, yeah. background stuff. So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And growing up, I was really into the arts. I was a dancer. I was in, I was such a musical theater kid. And um, 
my local high school was really known for their musical theater program. They put on these huge shows. So like as a kid, it was like such a dream to like go to high school there and like perform in their shows. And I would go every year to go see them. Um, and so that's kind of what happened. I ended up when I got to high school, I was always in their shows. I also was really into like a lot of other things growing up. I was really into math and sciences. So I really thought I was actually going to pursue a career in either biology or neuroscience. So it was actually when I was applying for colleges, I applied to the University of Pittsburgh to do neuroscience. Uh, and I was kind of just going to leave behind all my theater. And I love performing, but it was always just like a hobby for me. I never really saw it as a career. So I started my first year at the University of Pittsburgh, kind of taking, you know, like the general ed classes of like chemistry, biology, all those classes. And I realized I was miserable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, what do I do? And um, so I got involved in a couple of their, the University of Pittsburgh, they have a musical theater club, and I got involved in some of their productions. And then I got involved in some of the lab productions that they do there um, performing. And I really realized how much I missed theater and wanted to get back into it. Um, but I was still in this kind of dilemma of like, oh, I don't want to be a performer. What do I do? So I had the opportunity to um, assistant stage manage and stage manage some of the shows that were happening there. And I was like, OK, you know, I really find I think I'm finding my niche here. I did a couple more shows stage managing and was kind of already getting burned out. And I was like, wow, I've only done a couple of productions. So, uh, I don't think stage manage management is the, uh, the it for me. I ended up taking this really unique class that our university offers called Intro to Theater Design. And what they do is split um, a semester up into three different courses almost. So the first five weeks you're taking costume design. The next five weeks you're taking um, lighting design. And then the last five weeks you do kind of a, a basic instruction in scenic design. And I really thought I was going to like lighting design or costume design, but I really fell in love with scenic design. We had to do like an end of semester project where we were basically doing a concept design for all my sons. And uh, I went like above and beyond on this project. It was like, I remember I was presenting it to our class and I was almost humiliated because I had just done like, I, you could tell I like got really into it and it was just like a basic introductory class <laughs> and as I was presenting I was like oh god like and my professor who became my mentor Gianni Down he's incredible he he basically stopped me at the end of it. he was like why are you so embarrassed and I was like I don't know I just feel like you know maybe I went a little too like into this and he was like you know what I really want you to assist on my next scenic design that he was doing there. And I want you to see if you like this, because I really think that you have like a heart for this. And I was like, all right, sure, why not? <laughs> and so I started assisting him and I started taking some scenic painting classes there as well. Really kind of just fell in love with it all. Um, and then I started designing some shows at Pitt and I became like the student scenic charge for the department. And so I don't know, it kind of just, <laughs> happened for me and um, just trying different things I think kind of led me to like what to scenic design and scenic artistry and now what I'm doing so it was really great. Mm -hmm. I What I love about your story is that I think so many people can relate to trying all these different things and you know mm -hmm. uh, you know so many people go off to college and they're like okay this is what I want to do and then right. you know when you get to college you change so much and you discover like Oh, like there's a reality sometimes that hits when you it's so pursue true. different majors. Um, but yeah, it's never like at the straight line of like you never <laughs> decide. Well, right. I should say never, but it's very rare for people to to know exactly what they're going to do when they start out in college. Or yeah, it's so true. I feel like too. Like I look back to high school and I remember taking those like online quizzes and I forget, I don't even remember what class, but like to determine what career path is good for uh -huh. you and like there's never an answer that's going to say scenic design or uh, mm -hmm. technical direction <laughs> or scenic painting so I think it's kind of one of those niche careers where you like don't like some people maybe they have always known they're going to go into it but you're right it's like something that I think a lot of people almost stumble into mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I remember on mine like 
they, it said like I, I scored so I'm a musician and I scored so low in the arts like that was my lowest one and I was so <laughs> mad I was like this is a bunch yeah. of crap like these tests don't prove anything <laughs> I was like yeah. so offended by my test scores <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I said something about like going into like PR or marketing, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> um, um, so, what what do you think um, grabbed you about scenic design? Like, what was it? Do you think that just you know made you come alive and made you really excited? Yeah. Well, one thing I think is there's such the one thing I was missing from stage management was like the artistry behind it. Mm-hmm. I love the storytelling of like any production but I think scenic design like you can really create a world along with your fellow like collaborators with the costume designers and the lighting designers but like as a scenic designer you're kind of the one to first delve into like what the set's going to look off look like and I just think it's a really unique way to just tell a story I, I love the opportunity to be able to be working with other people, to talk to the directors and understand their concept and kind of get on board with that and, and find this way for all of you to work in your specific details to it, to create this overall world for the actors and for the audience to really kind of um, believe that they're in. So I think that's what really excites me. And just the fact that I, I'll be working on a bunch of different productions at once and the just to see all the different personalities and the different concepts that people come up with I I I just think it's it's such a unique field to be working with so many different people and to like one you might have one world for one show and just like how different it can vary from show to show even like if you're working on the same production how um, a concept can kind of vary from that and uh, I, I really love being able to work with other people and be able to tell some very unique story. Mm -hmm. So then now you are in New York City, take us through that transition, like what led you to live there and kind of and how that transition was for you, you know, going to the to such a big uh, competitive environment. (laughs) Right? Yeah, it was always kind of my dream to end up in uh, either New York or some sort of like big city to at least um, in my in the younger part of my career to kind of like delve into the professional scene there. And so after undergrad, um, I didn't feel cre- quite ready to jump into New York City. So I ended up doing a year long apprenticeship at a theater company in California, where I really got to focus on my drafting skills, and my model building skills. And it was a year that really prepared me and made me feel ready to be able to jump into a city. So First, I was really in between LA and um, New York City since I was already out in California. But something really drew me to coming back to New York and to the East Coast. And, you know, a lot of the designers that I was like really starting to study and to love were all here. So honestly, I started reaching out. I just started cold emailing a bunch of um, designers here. I was doing it to LA and to New York, um, but I was kind of just getting an idea of what if there might be work there for me, what I'm kind of looking at in terms of a career of a, in assisting or even set designing and painting. I was reaching out to different paint shops and um, different smaller theaters to see if maybe I could design at uh, certain theaters. So I ended up getting some responses from a couple of designers here in New York. When you're emailing them about four months out, I'm such an anxious person. So I'm like, oh, you know, I, I need to know if I'm going to have work. I'm going to have work. But it's funny because going through undergrad, a lot of my professors would tell me, you know, when you go to New York City or to these bigger cities, you just kind of have to be there to mm. find the work. And that was the most daunting thing to be told. But I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. OK, if that's what they're saying, if that's what they're saying. And, you know, it's kind of true in a way, um, because a lot of the responses I would get back from these designers are great. We love your work we love your models, email us when you get here and we'll see. Um, so it's like, okay, they're interested, but also, uh, I don't have a job. Um, <laughs> so I kind of ended up moving here with the hope that these, like the responses from these designers was true and that I would get work. And luckily in my case, it was true. Um, so I have recently been assisting Jason Artisan West, who's a scenic designer here. Uh, one of his like bigger works that a lot of people know is uh, his production design for uh, Jesus Christ Superstar Live that NBC did. 
And it's funny because I remember watching that in either my junior or senior year of college and being just so blown away by this set design. <laughs> and then when I saw my professor from undergrad sent me the opportunity that he posted looking for assistance. And I think I emailed him within an hour because I was like, oh, like I want that. I want to work for him. Like that, that mm -hmm. would be a dream. And he almost emailed me back like right away. I think this was in July or so. He said, you know what, when you get to the city, let's meet up. We'll meet on this date. And that was kind of like the first solid interview that I had. Like everyone else kind of was like, yeah, email us when you get here. And so I had a really good feeling about this one. And luckily it ended up falling or like ended up happening. And so I've been working almost full time for him, for him since I've moved here officially in October. Uh-huh. Well, congratulations. That sounds like a really great opportunity. What does it look like when you're assisting um when you're assisting a, a designer? It's very fun. Uh, <laughs> so I work I work in Jason's studio. I work kind of a normal, which is abnormal for theater, I should say, but um like a, I work ten to six almost every day. <laughs> um and yeah, every every time I tell someone in theater that they're like, What? So like a nine to five? Like that's not <laughs> I'm like, I know. So it's it, it's it's a bit getting used to, but um I, I think I like it so far. Um so we get there and usually the day starts with Jason kind of either checking in with projects that we've already been working on or he'll give us a list of things to kind of get going on. Primarily, I'm, I've been doing a lot of model building. Um, there's, he has a lot of shows coming up. <laughs> so it's been a lot of building uh, theater model boxes, the traveling boxes that they have to usually be shipped in, and then building the actual like scenery for the show that is being designed. A lot of drafting. He has a couple other assistants that come in and out and they've been doing a lot of like rendering stuff for his shows as well. So it can really vary day to day, which is fun because then there's always something new happening. Uh, and it can be interesting as well because Jason can either be there in the studio or sometimes he's out traveling for his shows. And so it's it's been a very interesting way to learn how to communicate with designers when they're there and when they're not there. So mm -hmm. um it's been a great learning experience and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. So was there anything that surprised you about moving to New York city? Like anything unexpected? You know, I, I shouldn't have been surprised by this, but <laughs> of course it's one of those things where like you don't fully get the real effect until you get here is um, you very much start out as a small fish in a big pond, <laughs> um, which I think is kind of but like, I t you tell yourself that going into it, but like, I remember the first day being in the studio here and there were two other assistants and I've never been in a place where there's so many assistants and like we all have varying backgrounds but we all like have similar skill sets so it was almost kind of scary at first I was like oh no I'm not like where I was last year it was me and one other assistant and then there were no really other theater companies in the area so it's like you feel like you're kind of like the master assistant <laughs> and mm -hmm. then you come to a city where there's hundreds of assistants and tons of designers and you're basically at like the theater capital of the country and um, kind of one of those like oh crap like <laughs> um, mm -hmm. scary moments but it's kind of gone away it's like you know if I'm here I'm working I'm, I'm doing my best I'm doing my hard work yeah, that was kind of like a, I remember the first day calling my mom after work. She was like, how was it? And I was like, oh, I, I love it, but I'm definitely a small fish in a big pond now. Mm -hmm. So, but it's also like on the flip side of that, I'll say, um, I think there's this kind of layer of scariness of coming to New York where you think because it's, you know, the biggest city for theater that like, it's going to be rough and people are going to have certain personalities, but like everybody has been so pleasant to work with so far. <laughs> um, I was thinking, you know, I kind of like got a little nervous when I realized I was a small fish. I was like, Oh, well, what if the other assistants are going to be competitive or, but like when you're working with the, for the same designer, you're all working, you know, for the same end product. So you're more collaborative, obviously. So it was the, kind of that fear dwindled away after the first couple of days too. And you realize, you know what? Like we're all in this to together still and like assisting the same designer. So we're working together and, and not against each other, which is like really, really nice. Mm -hmm. That's something I find I found uh, that's really kind of an interesting topic to talk to people about. And that's 
like competition in the arts? Um, yeah. Like, does competition help creativity or does it hurt creativity? And like, where does competition play into a creative field? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny you say that because as I'm looking at a lot of grad schools for the future, that's like one thing that I think about a lot is do I want somewhere that's very collaborative? Do I want a competitive edge within the program? Like, what do I think is most beneficial for um, myself as a designer, especially? I think collaboration is the most important, but I honestly have thought like, I think having a healthy competitive edge is is good to have. I think in terms, and when I say that, I don't mean like being malicious to like your other assistants or like fellow designers or whatever, but I think it's more, I see their work and they see my work and I, I learn from them and they learn from me. And it's almost, it almost pushes us, I feel like to, Mm-hmm. to build our skills and I think having almost like a competitive edge that way where you see the levels of what you know your fellow um workers are are at and being able to know like oh that's the level I want to be at but I think it's more having an appreciation for their skill sets but not looking at it as like a as a threat or um mm-hmm. being malicious so I feel like it's it's kind of a balance I find that when everybody's kind of on board, having at least some sort of collaborative spirit, that's the most beneficial for the work. Mm -hmm. It's so easy, I think, to get kind of pulled into that. I don't know if it's like a Western culture thing, but like the got to get ahead. Yeah. Um, It's like, it's like we're all in like some race that's imaginary, you know? (laughs) Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. (laughs) Um, Where do you find inspiration? Um, as an artist and and how do you grow um, in your creativity? Yeah, I've been realizing why I love assisting so much is because I have found a lot of my inspiration from the designers that I'm working for. I'm such a visual person and just like such a hands-on person. And so I really think that I find my inspiration from looking at what works for the designers I'm working for and maybe like what works for them, but might not work for me and um, how I can like take those, the things that they're doing into my own process and how I can use that as inspiration. For instance, like the designer I worked for last year, um, Jason Boland, he's an incredible designer. And one thing I've like really learned from him, um, the space that we worked in was a very unique space and it was almost in a three quarters for us but it almost looks like it should be a proscenium space. It's very interesting. But he found ways to further his story and further his scenic design by creating these like beautiful elaborate floors, um, very painterly. And I just think there were just like little things that I've learned from that and how that can kind of like inspire a story or the the set design that I'm working or doing. Then another designer really that I was assisting, he really taught me um, the importance of balance in the set. And uh, so I don't know, it's just these, these, these lessons and these experiences that I get with these designers that I find so inspiring. And since it's like hands-on experience, I get to see it firsthand. And um, so I think that really, like, I, I like to reflect a lot on like <laughs> each experience or each show that I'm working on or each designer I'm working with. And then I kind of internalize that into like inspiring my work. Mm -hmm. Does reflection um, look like, are you just thinking about it? Are you writing about it? How are you, what does reflection look like to you? Sometimes I do write it down. I I have this journal. I have, I buy the same uh, journal for everything. So I have the same design of a journal, like five of them now. And uh, (laughs) I like to reflect just my thoughts or like, it's kind of my daily journal where I'll write my to-do list that I'm doing or you know when I'm in the studio what I'm doing today but I just like to kind of take a moment and like write down you know like this is what I learned in this experience this is what worked for me and this is what didn't work for me because I'm I'm an overthinker (laughs) I'm a I I like to reflect a lot on things so I feel like it's nice to look back on those things kind of remind myself what what each process brought and uh, how I can learn from it or how I did learn from it and move forward with it nice I love, uh, I love talking about the things that we're talking about. Is there, I, I love to ask people um, who have recently graduated or, you know, are a few years removed from um, a school situation, is what's something that wasn't taught in school 
Um, obviously school can't teach you everything. You know, I don't think, you know, there's some things you just, you have to learn on the job right. in real life, but is there something uh, that you weren't taught in school that you think would have uh, been beneficial? Um, okay. So I, I don't want to say I wasn't taught this in school. I was like warned about this. You kind of go over it, but I honestly wish there was more of like a class that taught me how to be a freelancer and what that mm-hmm. looks like and yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> how to do taxes and uh-huh. you know how to manage all of those things. I, I like always said that I felt like I was like, oh, like I'm, you know, I'm paying all this money to go to school and then I don't even know how to do taxes and these things. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so I really, it's, it's been really great because I, my, my cousin is an accountant, so he's been able to really help me out with that. But like, I think of, oh man, like if I would have gone into this world without my cousin helping me, like, I don't know how I would have done my tax. I mean, obviously I would have ended up going to like a tax consultant, but, um, just the importance of like keeping your receipts and making sure you're like keeping track of all your expenses and your travel and knowing like what is what I can submit for taxes and things like that. And also, I I mean, I also think I was warned about this, but it doesn't really hit you until you're kind of in, in the real world is that uh, the work, might not always be consistent and you may have days off you may have weeks off and I think for me and I think just for like my generation like that's a very daunting thing like we feel like we have to be so successful right out of college and like and Mm -hmm. have it all figured out but um it is okay to have breaks in work but like be smart about your savings and Mm -hmm. (laughs) and things like that so So yeah, I wish there was a little bit more of a direction of um, how the whole financial thing should go as being a young uh, freelancer, especially in New York City. (laughs) So yeah, I think so much of our, not only the arts industry, but I think a lot of industries in general are going to more of a freelance model. Yeah. Um, And so I think that's just where our culture is going. I think, I think more and more people are freelancing. And so how do we you know, if we're teaching or, or whatever, how do we teach skills that freelancers need? Because they're separate right. from getting a full-time job. It's even funny because even though I'm working almost full-time for Jason, like I still am contracted as a freelancer. Um, mm-hmm. So what's been really helpful is that he'll kind of email me. So he just scheduled, so it's what, November 19th. And we just decided what dates I'm going to be working for December and January, which is really helpful. And like, unfortunately that's not the case for all theater (laughs) jobs like I I picked up some paint shifts um with a theater downtown that was more you know abrupt within like a week out of doing that gig and so that's another thing in this whole theater world is a toss-up of you know when you're when you know you're going to be working in and not a, you could know a month out or you could know a couple of days out, or I've heard in some of my friends' cases, a couple of hours out. So. <laughs> yeah. As a musician, you know, we're coming up on the Christmas season. And so I mean, my calendar's packed I'm and sure. I'm like so excited. Like I'm thinking, I'm like, Oh man, I'm going to buy all these things. But then, <laughs> you know, like the mature side of me has learned like, no, no, like January and right. February, there's usually nothing. So you cannot spend all this yeah. money on fun yeah. things. <laughs> I know it's it's funny because um, I'm looking forward and I'm I'm designing two shows in March and this is one the first time that I will be designing two shows kind of like right on top of each other um, so I finally decided I talked with Jason my boss I was like you know what I think I'm going to start taking one day off a week so that I can really start focusing on like my own work uh, on top of also working for him four days a week because I just was like overworking myself I was trying to do all my personal projects on the weekends or in the evenings and I was just like you know what I need a day to myself but I'm already panicking like oh what is that one day of like not working for him gonna do (laughs) in terms of like my financials like am I gonna am I gonna make it to rent at the end of the month (laughs) and things like that but um I think in the end run I think my man my mental sanity will thank me (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Money is so hard. Ugh. Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, like you just mentioned, um, trying to, uh, take a day off. Do you have any other 
routines or practices that you do to help with stress? Uh, that is one thing I am still trying to figure out. Um, <laughs> I feel like I am, it's very difficult for me sometimes to kind of just shut off my brain from work. I always feel like if I have downtime, I should be working on a project or I don't know, reading and like the script for the next show that's coming up. So I think it's really important to schedule time. I've been getting in the habit of kind of planning my weeks ahead. So for instance, I've been building a model for another designer in Pittsburgh, kind of in my own time in my apartment. And so you know, I'll say, okay, I'll give myself Tuesday evening and and Thursday evening off, but maybe I'll work two hours when I get home from working my studio job on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then, you know, I kind of schedule things out for myself. I have a lovely park right next to my apartment (laughs) that whenever (laughs) I'm getting overwhelmed or just like need to step out, it's like the perfect getaway to just walk down along the river, along the Hudson. So, I also try to like schedule on times to just walk and to, I don't want to say block theater out because I mean, oftentimes I'm walking on the, <laughs> walking along the river, listening to show tunes, but, um, <laughs> but just kind of a get away from the stress and maybe the anxiety of an upcoming show or production that I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that you say that you schedule time. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause if sometimes if you don't schedule things, they don't exist and they will it's not true. Happen. It is true. I, when I was in therapy, my, the one biggest thing my, my therapist recommended, she's like, you need to schedule a time to worry. And I was like, what? (laughs) And she was like, yeah, like schedule one time a day that you're allowed to worry, but outside of those perimeters, you're not allowed. And I was like, okay. And like, in a weird way, it's, it's worse. Like sometimes I'll be like, you know what, I'm not allowed to touch this project or worry about this project until four o'clock tonight when I'm home and have time to actually look at it. But since I am not home and can't do anything about it, I'm not allowed to worry about it right now. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a favorite um, part of the design process? My favorite thing to do is to first read the script a couple of times. And genuinely, I love making inspiration boards or mood boards, which for me is really just going on Pinterest and I always start a new board and I like I love to like word dump words that I'm thinking of when I'm either reading the play or like a mood or even the texture or something and it really helps me because like I said I'm a very visual person so in a way like not only are the images I'm looking at informing maybe the texture I want to use on the floor or on a drop or incorporate it somehow into the design it almost creates the mood or feeling for the world for the world I'm going to design so like for instance um, I'm designing a show here and the words I was typing in I kind of realized were were leading me to like this these grays and these blues and these almost sad (laughs) um, undertones (laughs) and so I really think like that helps inform me as a designer um, how the how I'm going to create the world in in many ways yeah I think uh, my other favorite part of the process is just kind of like, is honestly creating the world with the other people and like talking to the director and just like finding the common theme of like what our concept is. And yeah, I think that's, that's my favorite part. Mm -hmm. I also saw, do you do some teaching? Are you involved in um, some sort of like education outreach or something? So I, I wish I was still a little bit more involved now that I'm in the city and getting settled. I hope to like kind of delve back into that world. I was a lot with my university towards the end of my senior year there. I was a part of USITT, which is the United States Institute of Theater Technology. And um, there's a national chapter, but a lot of universities have their own college chapters and so I was the vice chair of mine and one of the things the USITT was trying to do um, for the student chapters at the time was starting to get high schools involved. Since I grew up in Pittsburgh and my high school was in Pittsburgh and I was going to to college in Pittsburgh, I thought wow this is a perfect opportunity to kind of get my like use my high school as kind of um I don't want to say guinea pig, but like to see if we can do something with them that creates an outreach or connection with them um, and other high schools in the area. 
So we ended up putting together some technical theater workshops and field trips where the students would come down to the school and we'd take a couple hours or like an afternoon of a day and show them the different shops and kind of how things work. And if we had a production, we would show them the set and give them a rundown of that and like how things work. And some of our staff and faculty got involved too. And like one of our staff members, she's our operations manager and she also is a stage manager. So she created like this game that kind of informed what stage, the importance of stage management and whatnot, um, but made it exciting for high school students to want to participate in. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. so we, I found that very successful. And so then I also would go back to my high school and, um, help with painting, scenic painting and helping the students and teaching them how to scenic paint. And then I was designing for a local high school in Pittsburgh as well, where I got to work hands-on with a lot of the students and teaching them how to do paint techniques and how to properly paint and, Um, Just an overall like backstage etiquette and things like that. So I find that really important and I really loved doing that. So I'm I'm still trying to find ways to kind of uh, get back into that while I'm here. Last month, I got to go back and talk to the scenic scenic design one class at my undergrad and kind of give them advice on being on what being a young professional is like and what it looks like and how I kind of am making my little corner of the world in this, in this uh, career. Um, I try to be a mentor <laughs> to either college students or high school students when I can. And a lot of times my professors, when from my undergrad, if they have a student that's kind of looking for advice, will send them my way and I'll either talk to them or email them advice. I think it's important to give back in that way because I realize the only reason I'm here and doing what I'm doing is because of all the people that mentored me and advised me and I would have never loved scenic design if it wasn't for my college mentor Gianni or my high school director or different people and so if I can like shed any (laughs) sort of light on someone and give them direction of uh, onto something that they love doing that they can maybe turn into a career then I I feel very (laughs) like that warms my heart and so I think, I think one day I will want to go back and like actually work at a university level or in some sort to kind of um, be an, uh, a mentor or even a professor or something um, to students and kind of help them find their way in this career. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I mean, it's important. I think we all have an obligation to some extent to teach, even if it's not in like a formal university or school setting. We right to pass on the knowledge that we're learning (laughs) right yeah and I think it's important too because I mean for the my only theater professors were really great in 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 college but you know I had to take some gen ed classes we could just tell that some professors there like were very brilliant and knew what they were you know talking about but weren't the greatest instructors or the teachers or you could tell that they didn't want to be there teaching so I think the more people that know that they want to do that and be you know uh, influence in the educational world, like should definitely <laughs> at least explore teaching. So that's why I'd be excited to to go that route. Yeah, for sure. Dream show. What's one show um, <laughs> that you're dying to work on? <laughs> oh man, um, <laughs> everyone laughs at me for this, but I would love to work on a production of Shrek the Musical. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I have only had fond memories of I've worked on that show two times now and like they were just the best experiences like from start to finish just the people we were working with like the energy of that show honestly I just love I love the movie and the musical so much so it would just be (laughs) a dream um and I honestly like I've kind of been designing a lot of shows recently that are like I don't want to say depressing but not <laughs> not a spectacle <laughs> musical and mm-hmm. that's kind of um a dream of mine is to finally get a spectacle show because I haven't really done that yet so that would I think kind of be one of my dream shows to <laughs> to, to do <laughs> fun advice my last question um advice to young people or you could go like advice to your younger self oh yes 
say yes. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> but only at the at the right. If you for your keep in mind your mental sanity though. Um, I have had people mm-hmm. say like tell me they've said yes to too many things and then like, haven't been able to give their all to like all the things because they're so overwhelmed by everything. So I love to tell people say yes. Um, even if it's not what you're hoping to pursue, like I would say yes to stage managing staged readings at my, at my university, or if someone needed an extra hand painting a floor on a show, I like wasn't scheduled to work on like, yeah, I'll do it. I've met so many people out of just saying yes to jobs and being able to work with them on another job. If, If you have a good attitude going into something like you're more than likely to be asked to come back um, <laughs> to to work for people that like you. And I also think don't be afraid to reach out to people. I have cold emailed a ridiculous amount of designers or people in the industries that I'm just inspired by their work and just want to like hear either advice for them or just even just to say like, hey, I love your work and like it's inspired me. Um, I think in the long run, not only are you getting your name out there, but you're making connections with people that you may down the road end up be working for. My last piece of advice is it doesn't matter if you're, you know, doing exactly what you plan to do. Um, As long as you're being proactive and like going out there and trying jobs or or saying yes to things, it will eventually kind of lead you to what you want to be doing. I can't tell you how many times I've looked back on what my quote unquote five year plan would be and how it was always it has always changed. And it's because I've gotten involved with experiences that I didn't think I would and it's has inspired me to do something new and to try something different. Five years ago, if you would have asked me what I wanted to do, I would have told you I wanted to be stage managing a Broadway show or something. Um, And now that is far different. So yeah, I think say yes, reach out to people and you may not be where you want to be, but uh, if you just keep working and and doing those things and saying yes and reaching out to people, you'll eventually find your, your path in this world. Music for the Backstage Creative was improvised and performed by Ian LaRoy and the logo was designed by Zachary.